Hello and welcome to this month's mon not this month. Yeah, it is this month, isn't it? <laughs> this month's <Yeah. laughs> uh, monthly. I nearly said Monday. Monthly um, catch up with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague in Toronto, Colin Szynski. And it's uh, as so happens, it's actually quite an opportune moment to really s talk about what's going on in the markets because today, of all days, we've had um, some very important events. Um, we've had the um, had the UK budget. Um, just now, and trying to pick over the pick over the uh, bones of that. First and foremost, let's just get the risk warnings out of the way. Um, so we're going to pick over the, we're going to pick over the bones of the UK budget. Not really that much there to sort of drive markets one way or the other, though the FTSE is having a good day, um, largely as a result of some of the um, measures announced by the Chancellor, particularly the oil and gas sector, um, which has been given a number of tax breaks due to the falling oil price, which is again um, falling quite sharply um, after that inventory data that we saw uh, come out of the US um, just about half an hour ago where we got another build of 9.6 million barrels and the storage glut is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as a result, we're seeing West Texas crude prices hitting levels last seen um, in early 2009. So we'll have, a, we'll have a quick look at what's going to be, you know, what the outlook is for uh, crude. Uh, we'll look at the reasons for the um, massive gap between Brent crude and WTI and whether or not the falling WTI price will actually drag the Brent price down with it. Have a look at um, uh, some of the key euro crosses. Have a look at some of the key um, equity markets as well. Um, in light of the fact that we've got a very important meeting coming up in around about three hours' time, the latest Federal Reserve rate meeting. And uh, investors are really sort of frothing at the mouth, I think, Colin, aren't they? They're expecting some form of change or dropping completely of forward guidance. So um, yeah. what I'll do is I will hand the mic over to you, and you can basically talk to everyone about what you're expecting and then we can talk about what I'm expecting and then hopefully we'll get something that sort of comes somewhere in the middle. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. It is a big day in uh, for trading in the U.S. today with the uh, FOMC meeting. That's coming out. A uh, decision is coming out at 2 p.m. Eastern time, which is 6 p.m. in London. So that's a it's a four-hour time difference this, uh, this month, so uh, be aware of that. The uh, and uh, and so uh, ever since we've had the uh, the last couple of non-farm payroll reports have come in huge for the United States, and we've had a lot of upward revisions. So in terms of the Fed's dual mandate, the the unemployment side is going like gangbusters, and uh, and has encouraged the Fed. Obviously, uh, last year they they stopped their QE3 program, and they've been uh, cons head heading towards raising interest rates this year. The market has been generally expecting the uh, the Fed to start raising interest rates at its June meeting. And, uh, and the speculation has gone back and forth between earlier and, and later. And, and there's two pieces to the Fed decision that we're going to be watching for. The first one is this, uh, uh, the uh, language of can be patient. Uh, Fed Chair Yellen and others have said basically patient means two meetings. So if they leave it in, it means no interest rate increases in June. If they take it out, it means that they could start raising interest rates in June. Last meeting they were still patient. which Potentially, which, yeah, because that's as soon as June, it could be later. Uh, I, I should clarify that because mm. I'll talk to that more in a, in a second. The, uh, so as soon as June, they could start raising interest rates. And, and they've talked before about that. Uh, in their last minutes, they said, well, before we start raising rates, we'll, we'll change our guidance. And, and some of them have members have talked before about wanting to move to a, a meeting-by-meeting decision-making process rather than, uh, rather than uh, just saying we're not going to do anything for a, a certain period of time. So, and just dropping the guidance completely. Yes, and just dropping it completely. So it looks as though uh, basically after June, all bets are off. It doesn't mean that they'll start in June, but odds are any time after June, they could start to do something uh, depending on, on, on how the data, the data goes. And, and so the other thing we want to watch for is not just the statement, but also the, uh, the tables and the Fed member projections. And there's two in particular. One is what I call the connecting the dots, which is the, uh, the Fed member expectations for, uh, for interest rates at the end of the year. Because then you ask yourself, well, how are they going to get there? And, and in December, you had a, a core group of Fed members that were saying they want uh, interest rates between about uh, – 
75 to a uh, 101 percent by the end of the year. That was about nine members. There is a hawkish group of about six members that were looking more like 1.5 to two, and there is a devish group of two members that were saying we don't want we don't want to do anything this year. So, but I mean, the, that's, 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 that's that pie change? in the sky, isn't it? Isn't it? That's pie in the sky, really, isn't it, Colleen? I mean, 0.75 to one. I mean, that's four times what rates are already. Yes, but they're already nothing. I mean, as the as you're coming, it's, it's anything when you come off zero. Well, it's zero it's, to zero point two five. That's the corridor. There's an interest rate corridor, isn't there? The Fed yeah. funds rate, and that's the Fed funds rate is zero point two five to zero. Yeah, what you're looking at is if you were going to get to 1% by the end of the year, you're looking at three interest rate increases. So if you take the gradual approach and go and do a quarter point every other meeting, you start in June. If you want to get there and, and do a more delay but be more aggressive and, and basically put it into the back half of the year, you can start mm -hmm. as late as September and do three increases in a row at the end of the year. So the Fed still has quite a bit of, uh, of flexibility. And, and, and in the past, I mean, we're talking about going from uh, an incredibly low interest rates to to getting back to something that's that's halfway back to your, your long term goal of of two percent that mm. uh, that and, and back a few years ago when uh, when some countries did raise interest rates coming up out of this like Canada went from fifty basis points to a uh, to one percent and at the time that did not it didn't do anything to hurt the economy because it was it was coming up out of a recession and things were ramping up but, yeah, but it gave them the that flexibility because... now to come back and cut rates mm. when things did slow again so but I think you'll see some when global interest rates an awful lot higher then not necessarily Fed was running QE1 at the time are they? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I'm talking global interest rates, as in, you know, China and countries yeah, like I that think weren't they significantly the higher. Point. Yeah, um, I mean, and that's, that's that's really where I think you and I sort of tend to part company in terms of what we're expecting. But yeah. in terms of this chart that we've got in front of you, what do you what do you expect with respect to the S and P if the Fed sure. does drop patience? Sure. If, if the Fed drops patients, I, I think you're starting to see this again. I think you might see a drop back towards the lower end of this trading range that's emerged between about 2040 and about 2120 is a, is a channel that's started to pull out. Maybe maybe 2000 as the round number is your next uh, support after that. But uh, but basically what you're looking at is the S&P has had a huge move up. You'll probably, if you do see the Fed drop patient, then you'll probably see it just kind of drift lower. I think over the, the, the sell slide you saw last week and, and the stabilization in the last few days is telling us that I think that's already been priced in. And, mm. uh, and, and so then the other piece we want to look at, uh, Michael, I, as I talked about connecting the dots, and, and as you've talked to, and, and I think you'll want to probably want to talk to more, is the inflation expectation because mm. the, the question is even if they say, okay, well, all bets are off after June, well, right, I, I outlined two scenarios. You could go and you could start in June, you could start in September, you could start at any meeting in between, you could start later. And I guess even, even if they do drop the, the patient, the, the June, uh, June liftoff isn't carved in stone by any strategy. And maybe you want to talk to that in inflation. Well, yeah, because I think if you know the Fed does drop patience and then they cut their growth forecasts and they cut their inflation forecasts, what does that mean for a rise in rates in June? I think it virtually takes it off the table. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it would have to put it off to uh, to September because you would mm. expect that that if they're heading into raising interest rates, that they would be doing it at a time when they're also raising raising their expectations. And if they're not raising their expectations, yeah. then, then you've got to wonder, right? I mean, you, the two would go hand in hand, you'd think. You, you'd, you'd think expect. so, wouldn't you? If, the, if you'd for expect. the Fed to be consistent, and the Fed has a 2% a two percent infla <coughs> two percent inflation target, and that and it's core inflation, and core inflation is currently around about 1.4, 1 1.5%, I think. I think, think. So. Yeah. And it's tracking lower. So, and we've just seen oil prices just um, hit another six-year low. Swedish Central Bank have cut rates again in the last half hour. Twenty central banks have cut rates this year already, um, and some, some of them more than once. Um, you look at what uh, U.S. Um, housing starts did yesterday. You look at what U.S. manufacturing did earlier this week, you look at what U.S. retail sales have done, you look at what U.S. durable goods have done over the past three or four months, they're all tracking lower. So I would actually argue that the jobs numbers are the outliers here, and they're actually not, um, you know, they're, they're probably not 
um, consistent of a strongly growing economy. Um, because when you actually put them all together, if there's no wages growth, there's no inflation, and the U.S. consumer is reluctant to spend money despite the fact that oil prices have more than halved in the past six months, then what's stopping them? Are they paying down debt? Or do they just not feel comfortable? So this is my concern. I think there is a, I think there's a consensus that people think the Fed are going to raise rates, and I'm just not sure that they will. But you know, it is what it is. The markets are pricing it in. I think really it's going to be very muddy in terms of what the markets will do at six o'clock this evening when Mrs. Yellen sits down and holds her press conference. And really, it's about how she manages the message. If they remove patients, if they don't remove patients and they leave it in there, I think you can expect the dollar to um, unwind lower very, very mm -hmm. quickly. And the stock market and the stock market could absolutely take off. Yeah, the stock, the stock market could go back through 2085 here, which is at the moment a significant resistance level of the, on the S&P. What's, what's been holding down U.S. markets has been this expectation that, uh, or, what's, or uh, it's not quite true, what's not it's not a question of what's holding them down. What's stopping them from going up even higher is an expectation that monetary policy between the U.S. Fed and the European Central Bank is going in different directions. I'm yeah. not sure that it is, but we will find out soon enough. Um, but if, if, if patience stays in there, then I think you can expect to see um, a move higher in stocks. And even if they take it out, and then Mrs. Yellen is very dovish, that could that could actually help put a floor under stocks if we do get a bit of a sell-off around about 2084. And I think it's a similar sort of story with the Dow, isn't it, with respect to this chart here. We are yes. looking to we are looking to track a little bit lower on the oscillator, but we know very we know to our cost that sometimes that's not a true reflection of where the market can go. So um, it's going to be you know it's going to be quite interesting in terms of what happens over the course of the next few sessions, but as we can once again see here on this chart, the, the, the key levels on the, on the Dow are these peaks through here around about 18,000 and these troughs around about 17,625. So I would guess that we're probably going to get a sharp, these are your barriers, we're slap bang in the middle of it and uh, I'd, probably, I'd probably steer clear of it until the dust settles. Yeah, and on top of the U.S. indices, I, I think we'll see probably a lot of volatility in gold, euro dollar, and in, in really a lot, I mean, any dollar pairs, CAD dollar, stir, um, cable, and, and, and all the rest of them, I think. So we'll let's, have have a quick, some... let's have a quick look at them. So euro dollar. Um, I think there's potential for that to be building up for a bit of a short squeeze. Um, at the moment, it's not immediately obvious if we look at this line that I've drawn in here. Highest from December currently come in all the way back above 109, that trend line. I'm not looking at that. What I'm looking at is this resistance line at 106.85. I think that, for me, is the key level. But what I think is more interesting here is actually if we strip this chart down even further to, say, the one-hour chart, um, the lows are getting progressively higher. They're not particularly strong, but every time we track lower, um, we are finding a little bit of we are finding a little bit of support slightly higher levels. That being said, we're still struggling between 106.30 and 106.85. So I think any any expectation that the Fed is anything other than um, hawkish tonight could see euro dollar squeeze higher. So certainly worth keeping an eye on that. And the fact of the matter remains, I think everyone thinks euro is going to go down. Yeah, it's and a very crowded trade. Yeah. Yeah, it and is. I think at this point you're getting pretty washed out short term. Longer term it's still weak, but in short term you're uh, I think it's it, that says it all, doesn't it? It does. 93%. Ca cash positions 93% short. And that's only 1% down from this time yesterday. So, you know, basically the markets are banking on a fairly hawkish Fed this evening. And even if the Fed are hawkish, I'm not sh too sure how much further upside there is in euro dollar, um, basically because I think it's it's pretty much one way. But at the moment, this doesn't really tell me anything on the dailies, so I'm a little bit cautious. But what I have seen on euro sterling 
actually um, does concern me a little bit. I certainly think there's potential for a bit of a short squeeze there. We've seen that on this four-hour chart here. Yeah, it's um, break out. It, it's starting. It's giving the impression that it's starting to break out, and a lot of that is probably more sterling weakness than euro strength, given the run that we've seen over the course of the past few months. But we've certainly got very strong, impulsive up moves in those candlesticks there. We've got a strong impulsive move there and there and there and there. And that suggests that the market is short. Yes. And could you, not could, as, could, could, not as could you also as put it, the RSI up on that, Michael? Yeah, I can. And you'll see, the, uh, you'll see a turn in momentum. Just the ordinary one, yeah? Ten yeah. event? Yep. Yeah. Oh, you're using a shorter chart. If you put yeah, it up on the daily hours. chart, the RSI yeah. is just rolling up out of a downtrend. But what You'll we've also got I mean. here, but what there. we've also and got here, all we've got here is a bullish engulfing day. Yes. So, and that bullish engulfing day generally tends to be the precursor to a slight trend change, and it is quite strong. What we've also got here is it's not quite a hammer, but it's pretty close to it. It's got a very long shadow on the downside. So that does seem to suggest that we could actually um, be getting ready for a bit of a squeeze higher towards 73 uh, uh, to the levels that we last saw at the beginning of this month. We've seen a very, very strong down move over the course of the past few months. Um, but I think there's potential for a little bit of a short squeeze and we could actually come back to these levels here. Now, what could cause that? Well, obviously, the, the, the pound is weak and the pound is weak for a reason. Um, we did see um, a significant um, improvement. In, well, we, we've seen we've seen some fairly positive economic data this morning, but apart from average earnings, average earnings actually dropped back below two percent. They came in at one point eight percent. Given what Carney said last week, and given what the minutes showed this morning, the Bank of England minutes, it suggests that a, a rate rise is pretty much further out into the future, and that's undermining the pound against not only the dollar, which has taken a significant hit against, but also now, to a lesser extent, against the euro, where it's had a very strong positive run. There is potential we could actually start to track back to 73. So it could be sterling weakness that drives that, or it could also be a bit of euro strength. We'll soon know um, after the meeting, but I certainly think in terms of the short squeeze, maybe the euro's probably got more legs in it um, rather than the pound, which has broken out on the downside and broken out quite substantially below 148.30, mm -hmm. um, which, which was actually a significant breakout level. And um, I'll bring that I'll bring that chart up um, once it um, decides that it wants the size it wants to pull it. On the interim, well, Michael, while we're yeah. uh, while we're talking about uh, about cable and, and sterling, we've got the we've got the the, the, the draft today off of some of the, the budget and, and the data, but perhaps we also want to look at this, this longer term weakening trend. How much of this is, is U.S. dollar strength and how much of this is, uh, is uncertainty related to the election that's coming up? To the election, I think there's a certain amount of uncertainty with respect to the election, but I, don't, I, I, think, I think you're overestimating it slightly. Um, you know, generally, if you look back at the 2010, election. In the lead up to that, we saw a significant bout of sterling weakness. So that's nothing new. I mean, basically, generally, markets don't like the uncertainty that a change in governments can bring. But certainly in terms of currencies, a decline in sterling before an election is nothing new. We right. got it in 2009 when the pound was up around 171 and it traded as low as 142.30 in the aftermath of the May 2010 election. So I certainly think there's potential for us to maybe go all the way back there. Um, do I think there's potential for us to go much lower? Only if the US decide that they want to push through a, a, a rate rise sometime this year, because I certainly don't think that the UK is going to be raising rates this year, um, given concerns about what's happening over the pond in Europe or over the channel in Europe. But this, you know, this trend in the pound against the dollar is quite significant. We've broken this 148.30 level. We've been in a downtrend since the end of February. If we look at why I drew in that 148.30 level, 
we can see there it was these twin lows that we saw in 2013. This week we broke below that. We haven't you've as retested, yet, haven't you? And we have retested it, but we haven't got back above it. Yeah. As we can see from so these really two days bearish, here. Technically. So technically that's quite bearish. So, yeah. you know, for the time being what I'm expecting to see here is further downside in the pound, which sort of does tie in a little bit with my Euro sterling rebound trade because the sterling will weaken you may find that euro dollar goes up faster than the pound against the dollar and as such obviously that will push euro sterling higher so 148.30 is really the key level we need to get back above to under to basically get out of this move down from the 155.50 highs that we saw in mid-february yes we really were up above 155 um, towards the end of last month and now here we are um, nearly 10 cents lower at around about 146, um, 70, 80. So, you know, we've come quite a long way. A lot of that is down to a little bit more dovishness in terms of the interest rate outlook for the UK relative to the US, and you're seeing that trade unwind in the pound against the dollar. But to be fair, the dollar's up pretty much against everything. So the pound just hasn't, the pound is probably playing catch up to a certain extent with, with, the, with the dollar's gains. But I think if you're looking at an indication of what the markets are thinking about the dollar, look at dollar-yen, because the dollar-yen is tracking lower and it's on the lows of the day. So I think the markets are starting to get a little bit nervous of the fact that we could actually see um, a slightly dovish Fed um, at, uh, um, at this afternoon's meeting. And certainly I think if we take out these series of lows through here, then we could actually see quite an abrupt sell-off. And that level there is 120.60. Why is 120.60 important? I'll tell you why. If I extend that back, I bet it cuts through those two peaks there within 10 or 15 points of it anyway. Yeah, very close. And then further back, and look at that. Yeah. So 120.50.60, ladies and gentlemen, is quite a key support level on dollar yen. If we if we drop below that, then I would guarantee that there's probably quite a few stop losses on long positions down through that level there. Let's look at the client sentiment on that. Again, um, cash positions are sitting net long dollar yen. That's up 22% on the day today. And that's why you're seeing this. I think this is why you're seeing this little bit of a sell-off here in dollar yen um, and probably why you're probably going to see um, a drop in yields on US Treasuries if we get a significantly dovish Federal Reserve so certainly worth keeping an eye on that so what's driving dollar yen is it euro yen or is it euro dollar well I wanted to show this chart to you because it's actually quite interesting look at euro yen it's found a very good let's put, you know, let's put 129.2025 is quite a key level I think on on euro yen so um, it's worth keeping an eye out on that on, on any spike higher because will it be euro yen that, or euro dollar that pushes that lower or will it be dollar yen I would suggest it probably be dollar yen if we break above it then we could well get a significant short squeeze into this cloud Ichimoku cloud one thing I have noticed is FTSE 100 has suddenly gone for a nice little trip to the top side. That's really now, taken off in the last little while. Yeah, it has. It was up, I but think, not this much. No, I think that's been driven largely by the oil and gas sector with those tax mm -hmm. breaks that Mr. Osborne announced. They were well trailed, but I think they were slightly more than people expected. But also, um, financial services, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, St. James's Place, they've jumped sharply because of the um, relaxation of the annuities rules and obviously the help to buy ISA, as well as the um, abolition or, or, or the, the, the implementation of a tax-free allowance on your first £1,000 of savings. Um, I think that's actually helped push the share prices of um, investment firms up, and we can, so I think we can see that Hargreaves Lansdowne is actually now probably near the top of the FTSE, it's around about 3% up, but also help to buy ISA um, has helped 
push housing stocks up as well. Taylor Wimpy is up 3% today as well. So, you know, I think all in all, some of those budget measures have helped on the margins. Haven't helped the bank so much. The raising of the bank levy has knocked banking shares down. Lloyds Bank is down ever so slightly, and RBS is also down ever so slightly. Um, but um, certainly this breakthrough, this resistance level at 68.60, classic buying opportunity um, on the breakout. I think I touched upon it in my weekly video. It was a big, big resistance level. Generally, when resistances break um, or supports break, they, they reverse their roles. This double top here, we broke out, we broke lower, hit our target, which was around about 67.50, broke through, went all the way down to 66.80 acted as resistance on the way, came back, now it's busted through, now it's probably going to act as support, and the big question now is, are we going to see a test of the all-time highs? Judging by the impulsiveness of these two four-hour candles, there does appear to be an awful lot of momentum behind this move, and while we're only an hour away from the close, I would be surprised if we actually saw it break above this all-time high, but there is a good chance that we could go for a little trip higher before we come back down. Because as with anything, momentum's everything. But um, at these sorts of levels, um, I think certainly the market's going to want to have another go at it. Yeah, that's a very strong trend behind it at uh, at this point. Perhaps, Michael, you could bring up the DAX because that's been uh, that's been acting a little bit differently here. The, it has. Uh, the we've, DAX. Had, we've had nine it's, successive weeks of gains. This will be the tenth week of gains if we see it, but at the moment it does appear to be running out of a bit of gas. Yeah, that was huge on the chart. It just looked like it's gone totally parabolic and just like really getting overly, uh, pretty much overdone. And you can see it on the uh, on the stochastic how over how overbought it's gotten down but at the bottom a, there. I mean, this is mm, a trading correction. This it's is a proxy a, uh, for the euro, though, isn't it? This is a proxy for yeah. the euro. Weak euro, strong DAX. Yeah. So what's going to what's going to what's going to reverse that? What's going to reverse that proxy, or 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 is the proxy going to remain intact? If the if if the DAX comes down, will it be because the euro rebounds? Because they have been moving in conjunction with each other. It could be, and the euro's been the euro as as we've seen looking across multiple uh, multiple pairs. The euro's been uh, been bottoming out. It's looking like it's pretty yeah. much getting pretty washed out here, and the DAX really was getting pretty overdone to the upside, and that's been fully uh, fully baked. And uh, here, I mean, this is on, on this side. You're looking at a normal, at a pretty normal trading retrenchment that uh, mm. that was probably overdue just because it got so overextended. Well, we've also got an inside bar yesterday, so. Um, or an inside candle, or Harami, uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get a reversal, but I think it does say that the market's a little bit nervous about being overly long at these sorts of levels. I wouldn't say that it means necessarily we're going to get a reversal because we did get a little bit of a pullback there, mm -hmm. but then we just carried on as we were before. But certainly that 12,200 level does appear to be a little bit of a resistance in the short to medium term. And I really, see that candle was. Kick, uh, the bottom of that sh of today's shadow was around 11.8, so maybe you're moving into a uh, into a sideways channel that you might sit in for a few days. I think if we close 11.8 and 12.2, mm. I think if we close below 12,000, we might see a washout of long positions. True. I think you know never under retest that trend line. Never underestimate the value of um, psychological numbers and the mm -hmm. fact that we close below it. But having having seen the you know, the cash positions in terms of longs and shorts, it's pretty equal. It's pretty equal in terms of um, where we are, 53% against 47 So on that basis, we could go either way. Yeah, so there's so, not a lot of conviction in, in that right now, and, uh, and clearly more more indecision than conviction. So true. again, we could see it go either way here. And, yeah. and that will also suggest that maybe you go sideways for a while, perhaps mm. to, through the end of the month when you uh, – bump up against that trend line again. Well, we've also got a weekend coming up, and I think what, it, what I think what was quite interesting was the narrative coming out of Europe with respect to a potential Greek exit, mm -hmm. um, or Grexit, as they like to call it. Um, the head of Eurogroup yesterday, um, Jerome Dijsselbloem, said for the very first time that it may be, it, it may be required that they need to implement capital controls 
to keep Greece in the euro. Now I've never heard them talk that way before. That's I think that was I think that was very very significant because in terms of capital controls, the only country that still has them at the moment is Cyprus, mm -hmm. and now they're talking about implementing them in Greece. Well, it's not exactly a vote of confidence, and we've got a weekend coming up, and Greece has to pay another €2 billion Euros to the IMF on Friday. Where are they going to find it? Down the, you know, down the back of the sofa. So they need to find that money, and I'm not sure where they're going to get it from. So we could, you know, we could be in for a bit of a surprise on Friday, because certainly the narrative from government officials between Greek officials and German officials is not particularly great. You know, you've got Fingergate, um, Mr. Vadifakis basically, you know, giving the finger to Germany. You know, I mean, granted, that was three years ago, and I think German media are being a little bit mischievous in wheeling that out again, but it does put him in a difficult position, as well as that Paris, Paris match photo shoot, which I think was rather ill-advised, but never mind. Um, so at the moment there is a, there is growing frustration amongst EU officials with respect to what's going on in Greece. So at the moment I'm not optimistic that it's going to be resolved satisfactorily. And if there is a Greek exit, that could manifest itself into a little bit of a sell-off. But as I say, we don't know how that will. That I don't know how that will ripple out if it does happen. So. And that'd be mainly a more on uncertainty than than anything, because I don't think that the Greece leaving would have such a huge effect on on an economy like Germany's. It's more the uncertainty and the, the domino effect, I think. Well, I think it's the domino effect of, you know, sort of default losses throughout the European yeah. banking sector. You know, and that more than anything, I think, is probably going to be more significant. Let's yeah. quickly have a look at crude oil, because um, I think we want to have a look at where we're going to go next. This is a one-day chart for WTI. Look, they may look as if there's an awful lot of tram lines there, but I think you can sort of see where I've, where I've drawn the support and resistance lines and why this particular line that I drew recently is so important. Um, what we've got here is this is the previous lows that we saw at the end of 2008, um, around about $35 a barrel. We've broken below the lows that we saw earlier this year, and certainly potential for us to go lower, particularly if we continue to decline the way that we have the way that we have been. This is the weekly chart and this is the daily chart. So I would be hoping that we need to get back above forty four, maybe forty five dollars a barrel in the course of the next few trading sessions to suggest that we won't see further losses. I think the fact that we've broken below the 2015 lows on a technical basis is quite significant. And I think it's something we need, we need to keep an eye on. Yes, because I think what you had was you had that huge sell-off at the end of last year in January. You've been, you've been consolidating and digesting for about six weeks now, and now you're starting to fall through the bottom again. And, and, and being back at 42, you're not far from 40 bucks, which... I think some of the governments in the Middle East have said they'd be, they can live with, but realistically, I think that uh, that uh, the, the, you're going to retest the 2008 lows near 35 at some point. It does seem that you're way. Kind of getting drawn that way. Mm. Now, Brent, this is a bit of a puzzle because mm -hmm. Brent is not following through. As we can see, we're still well above the lows that we saw um, earlier this year, around about 2015, and that was around about $45, $45 a barrel. Yes, because the spread had narrowed pretty much to zero at that yeah. low, and now it's and now it's widened back out yeah. closer to, well, it's about $11 right now. Well, we had a nice little hammer there, then we had a, then a bullish candle, and then we traded sideways before, before we edged higher. Now what we've got is a little bit of a consolidation. We are struggling around about $52, $53 a barrel, but there is strong support around about 51 If we look at this chart here on on a daily basis, I'm going to draw a line through that high there and that low there. You may think I'm clutching at straws a little bit, but certainly I think in terms of the low there and the high there, 
and the series of highs through here, there does appear to be a little bit of what I would call price congestion mm -hmm. through that area. So I would suggest that we probably probably need to see a move back to around about $51 a barrel, but it certainly does appear to be slightly more resilient. But there are more geopolitical factors at play when you're talking about Brent crude, which don't apply to US WTI. Mm -hmm. um, hence the spread. Hence the spread, which is, you know, again, starting to widen out again. So while you could see WTI track lower, you may find that Brent probably lags behind it by quite some distance. Mm -hmm. okay. While we're on the topic of oil, Michael, could you bring yeah. up dollar CAD? Sure. And um, what I wanted to talk about with uh, one thing with uh, with dollar CAD uh, in particular here, and uh, and keeping an eye on it is that when we were looking at the dollar yen chart earlier, it was looking like we're getting a bit, we might be getting a bit of a double top. And and what's also interesting is that we may be getting a bit of a double top here in dollar CAD as well. And and so today's trading will be particularly significant. We've got double T, uh, WTI breaking down, so this should be breaking at, but breaking out through 128. And as we see, we shot up it's and it, it didn't hold. Mm. It's not so we want to keep there, an eye it? on this one. As, uh, two stories. One is the uh, what is this telling us about WTI, and the second is is what's going on with the U.S. dollar. So this will probably be quite an active one, uh, also around the time of the uh, the Fed decision. Yeah, because that inventory number really should have weakened the Canada quite considerably, mm -hmm. and it hasn't. And it hasn't. No. So you well, wonder well, as you start wondering, does that mean it's it's priced in already some uh, uh, fairly weak WTI? At, uh, at this point, the other one that interests me, and I mean, if it does bust through, then and, and we start seeing WTI head under 40, this should head for 130. But uh, but so far, mm -hmm. it's uh, this 128-ish resistance has been holding. But we'll see what happens with the uh, with the U.S. dollar uh, at, at the Fed meeting today, because this will all this is where it all, it's, it's all kind of going to come together. It's washed out quite a few stops above 128, though, hasn't it? 128.35 was the high. Mm -hmm. So if you were short above 128, you'd have got washed out on those stops. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's always the risk with dollar CAD. It can overshoot, and that's what it's done today. Um, probably worth interesting having a look at gold, shall we? Sure. Same thing will also be big on uh, on U.S. dollar trading around 2 2.30. So now this look at this is again. This is a, this is a nice downtrend, but again. You know, we are we're still well below the lows that we saw at the end of last year, around about um, 11.30, 11 one, sorry, yeah, one one three zero. So, you know, we're sort of tracking lower. We need to get back above 11.70, and certainly, I think there is potential, perhaps, to retest those lows that we saw at the end of November. That's the next key support level on on gold prices, so I'm certainly keeping an eye on that. But you can certainly see here the trend is pretty much down. It's pretty conclusive that it's tracking lower. And what we need to know now is what it's going to do when it gets to this level around about here at 11.30. And we're about $20 away from that. Uh, Michael, could you put mm. this back on a daily chart and drop the uh, euro dollar on top? What I can, yeah, actually, I'll open a new chart. Get rid of that. And with the euro dollar on top. Right, okay. Because the two things, the two forces we're watching for with gold over the next. Uh, The two forces we're watching with gold is is over the next few days is, is uh, gold tracking against the U.S. dollar in terms of the Fed, but also how is gold tracking oh. against the euro? Sorry, I've just um, just lost the connection. Give me a minute. No problem. So I can talk a little bit. So the two forces yeah. that we're watching for driving gold is, is gold against the dollar and gold against the euro. Because gold against the dollar is basically the U.S. dollar has been going up on expectations of a more hawkish Fed sending, the, sending gold down. But gold also trades in relation to the euro. And there's two, the two pieces going on with the euro that we've been talking about lately. One is any political risks surrounding a, a possible Brexit that we could see play out over the next few days. If that suddenly uh, uh, pops up 
you could see some uh, movement in gold. And, and the other one is gold in relation to the uh, European money supply and uh, and the, the launch of the uh, the QE program, because over the last longer term, say four years, gold has been following the ECB balance sheet up and down. So we'll be keeping an eye on that uh, that as well. And and do they have to and do they have to uh, flood the system with money to to do it to stabilize the uh, the system and, and and what's going to go on there so between the two we could see quite a bit of action in gold with as these these forces uh, tug and push and pull against each other over the next uh, over the next week or two so gold does have the potential to be uh, to be quite active here on uh, on both sides because there's a lot of forces at work in the, in the in the market right now yeah we can and so he so there you go. The uh, red line or the purple line is euro dollar, and the black line is gold. So I mean, that's one feature that you can actually use quite nicely. It's called our overlay function. So you just drag and drop one chart on top of the other. It's a fairly useful feature to look for correlations. So what this looks like to me with gold was that for the most part, say over the last year, it's kind of more or less been tracking the euro lower, except mm. at a couple of spots here. One was back in June, and one was in January, and both of those, I believe, were around the time that the ECB made announcements related to stimulus, but it's been, it's been, they've been short-lived, so we'll keep an eye mm. on that, because it, uh, it still is a factor out there. Okay, so let's just get shot of that. Okay, so um, I think, you know, summing up, I think really it's a question of expectations this evening surrounding the Fed. Be careful for a dovish surprise, because I think market is a little bit one way with respect to expecting a fairly hawkish Fed. Um, so we could actually see euro dollar squeeze back towards 107 mm -hmm. um, and see dollar yen um, retest the bottom of the range. Um, keep an eye on, obviously, equity markets. Um, if there's any questions... Um, Colin and I are more than happy to accommodate them. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll wind this up and then we'll post this up on YouTube for you ladies and gentlemen to listen to it back if you so wish. So I'm going to throw the floor open to questions. And in the absence of any questions, I'd like to thank you all for your company and... Um, um, speak to you again, if not in the weekly Monday webinar, which we do at 12.15, um, but um, around about the same time next month. Is it the 16th of April? can't remember. I believe so. Yeah. Uh, and we so, will not have a non-firm payrolls uh, in April because its uh, payrolls are coming out on the 3rd, which is uh, a good, Friday, good Friday, and global markets are closed for the day. It's a good day to bury bad news, isn't it? <laughs> when the markets are closed. <laughs> All right, ladies and gents, thanks very much for your company. This is um, Michael Hewson um, signing off, and um, good luck with your trading today. Have a great day, everyone. It looks like it should be a busy one. Cheers, Colin. Thank you. Bye, Michael. Thanks.